When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew Simon, Peter's brother, spoke up, here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in the place that they sat down about 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed it to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. Then they had all had enough to eat. He said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is, who is to come in the world. I'd like to welcome you to our worship service this morning and welcome everybody at home as well. Would you please stand with us as we continue by praising our God in song.
your glory show us show us your power show us show us your glory lord Welcome to Grace Fellowship. Good morning. We are so glad you have joined us here today. If you're new here, there's these little connect cards we'd love to have you fill out and put in one of the offering baskets in the back. But for all gathered here, this is a special day. We've got a really cool potluck afterwards that Anna's going to tell you about in a couple minutes, but this is our new members Sunday as well. We get to welcome some new members into our church family, and I'm really excited for that. And sometimes we forget that that's what this is. This is a family. We believe that God has brought every brother and sister here together to be connected, to care for each other, to support each other, to celebrate the victories in life and go through those lows, those valleys together as well, to pray for each other, which is why actually I want to begin today by praying for our family here. 
Uh, yesterday, I got news that Trudy, um, she did not qualify for uh, treatment at Mayo that she was hoping for, and they, she's now has a different form of cancer, and she's going to have to go through chemotherapy. I want to pray for her. I want to pray for the Musilars, as they have lost a family member, Dave's sister-in-law, Pam, in the last week, and they're heading to the funeral in the next couple of days. I want to lift up Norma, Norma DeRyder. She this morning had to go to the emergency room because she was having trouble breathing. I want to lift up these family members because we care about them. They mean a lot. God brings us into a community like this so that we are one. And when someone's not here, we feel it. It matters. Let's pray. God, who breathed life into humanity, breathe life into Norma's lungs. Breathe strength Give her clarity on why she is struggling with breathing today. Give her relief. And we lift up Trudy. We pray that this other form of treatment, that it works, that you eradicate the cancer, that you free her, and that you give her strength as she's going through chemotherapy, that you be with her in this part of the journey, Lord. Help her to sense that you are going before her, above her, beneath her, behind her. And we pray for the Musilars. We pray as they journey to Indiana to grieve this loss, to celebrate and remember this life, Pam's life. We pray, God, that you guide them in that valley. You shepherd them in this moment. Be with their family. And help us as their family as well to come alongside these brothers and sisters to remind them that we love them, that we're praying for them, that we're here for them. Amen. So Paul, he describes the church in the book of 1 Corinthians. He describes it like a body. He says, just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. And whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, we're all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. And we get to officially invite four people to this body of Christ today. And we know that church is not just a service we go to. It's not just an entertainment event. We know that God brings us into communities like this so we can participate in what the body is doing. We have a part to play here, and we believe that. We believe that for the four people who are joining us today. I would like to invite forward Siri and Joy and Mike and Lori. If you guys could stand with me on the stage here. I'm going to take you through four questions from the gray hymnal. This might be like one of two gray hymnals we have in this whole building. Um, but what I'm about to read, it... I, th- I think it, it does the, a great job at summing up the core beliefs of our community. And we know God has made us a dynamic community, but we're solid at the core, but we're flexible at the edges. And we know that these things, these things are a great way to uh, know our identity in Christ, but also they're things we struggle with. As you hear their answers today, they're all going to say, I do God helping me. But we know that faith, it's one of those things that has an ebb and a flow And it's Jesus who gives us faith. He's faithful. He's always good. And so even as I read these questions, as you may be struggling with some of them, just know that that God is there for you. And so, Mike and Lori and Siri and Joy, do you now stand in the presence of God and his people, responding to the following questions? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, sent to redeem the world Do you believe that the Bible is the word of God revealing Christ and his redemption? Do you accept the gracious promises of God sealed to you in your baptism? And do you promise to do all you can, with the help of the Holy Spirit, to strengthen your love and commitment to Christ by sharing faithfully in the life of the church, honoring and submitting to its authority? And do you join with the people of God in doing the work of the Lord everywhere? And so, Mike, what is your answer? We do, God help you. Lori, what is your answer? And Siri, what is your answer? I do, God helping me. And Joy, what is your answer? I do, God helping me. You guys can celebrate. (laughs) 
We're going to take a moment, if any of them would like to share what made them want to be a part of this community, why, why grace is their place. Um, they can take a moment to do that. This is on. <laughs> I want to go first so that they don't take my answers. Okay. Um, <laughs> I really like the music. I like the sermons. I like all of you. Um, you've been really, really welcoming to me and Joy and these two as well. Um, we've just really enjoyed being part of this church, and we feel like we already were part of the church, so we're like, we might as well make it official. Yeah. Okay. My beliefs align with the church beliefs. That's why I wanted to join this church. So. Mm. Yeah, thank you. I just want to say that I'm glad I'm back here. So I'm just happy to be here. I'm glad you're here too. Um, I just wanted to say that thank you to all of you, some that I know and some I just started to get to know. Thank you for making me feel welcome. And I just want to uh, show, share my gift of prayer with the church. That's what brought me here. So that's all I'll say. <laughs> We have a tradition here at Grace. When people jo officially join our church family, we anoint them with oil. Throughout scripture, we see prophets, priests, and kings set aside and anointed with oil, a reminder that they've been anointed by God for incredible things, for an adventure ahead. And we believe that everyone who God brings into our community has been set aside by the Holy Spirit and anointed to join in the body of Christ and doing the work of the, work of the Lord everywhere. And so, Mike, may the Father continue to create something new in you. May Jesus be your light and your salvation. And may the Holy Spirit gift you for the work of God's kingdom. And Lori, may the Father continue to create something new in you. May Jesus be your light and your salvation. And may the Holy Spirit gift you for the work of God everywhere. And Siri, may the Father continue to create something new in you. May Jesus be your light and your salvation. May the Holy Spirit gift you for the work of God's kingdom. And joy. May the Father continue to create something new in you. May Jesus be your light and your salvation. May the Holy Spirit gift you for the work of God's kingdom. As a church family, let's pray for our brothers and sisters. God, you know that you have brought these brothers and sisters in this community to be loved, to experience your love, to embody your love, to be empowered by your love, and we pray for that today. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Good morning. We're just so thankful that you joined us for worship this morning. Before I give a few announcements, let's greet one another here in the building and those watching from home. And if you are watching from home, please make a comment so that we know you're there and we can say hi. Are this week's announcements. So if you are new here and got one of those visitors bags, we'd love for you to fill out those connect cards and put it in the offering basket at the tall table in the back. Then we can add you to the communication list and keep you on the loop of all that God is doing here at Grace. We also have more connect cards at the Ask Me booth um, for anyone who wants to be on our communication list. Come and see Come and drink, come and eat. Join us after the service for a Bread of Life Fellowship meal. We have soup, salad, bread, and desserts, and we look forward to sharing a celebration meal with all of you. 
We are partaking in a communion later in our service. This special meal is for everyone in the family of God. It reminds us of how Jesus died on the cross to save us. That includes members, visitors, and their children. Our bread is gluten-free, and we'll set aside some communion packets at the back table for folks who need social distancing. Holy Week is just around the corner. Put these dates on your calendar. April 10th is Palm Sunday. During this service, we are going to wave palm branches and remember how the High King of Heaven came down to save the world. At 7 p.m. on April 14th, we will celebrate Monday Thursday. This is a powerful service in which we go through all the stations of the cross, remembering Christ's sacrifice for us. And April 17th is Easter. We will celebrate the biggest event in human history, the resurrection of Jesus. We will also have cinnamon rolls and bacon-wrapped dates, so invite your friends and neighbors to experience Holy Week. We will have an Easter egg hunt, too. Experiencing Lent and Easter, a reminder, you are invited to explore and express artistic ways to experience the meaning of Lent and Easter. It will be, it could be a written prayer, story, or poem, photography, painting, or song. Be inspired by Sunday's messages, personal encounters, or devotions. We will share and display on Easter Sunday, April 17th. Bring to the table the week before or Easter Sunday. Title your piece and write a couple sentences on a 3 by 5 card explaining what it means for this Easter season. Any questions, please see Marianne Steensma. This upcoming youth group, March 30th, is for fourth grade through high school. Dinner starts at 5.30. And lastly, you may give to the general offering using the baskets on the way out of the sanctuary or via text or on our website. The Four Corners offering this March is being collected to support Lakeview Camp Fees. We will cover an entry for one camp per child for those who want to attend camp this summer. Thank you. Good morning. I would like to invite any youth up here to join me for the children's message this morning. Don't be afraid of the box. There's nothing explosive about this one. Some of you can join me on this side, too. Are we good? All right. Good morning, guys. How are you? Good? Are you good? You guys good? All right. Does anybody remember what we talked about last Sunday up here? Jesus said, I am the... Did we give out bottles of... I am the living water, right? And so this week we're going to talk about something kind of the same, but a little bit different. I want you to think about a time that you went without eating food. What's the longest amount of time you went without eating any food? Yeah. Two days. Two days without food. Were you sick? Yeah. Anybody gone longer than two days without food? Not longer? At school? No, like at home. Oh. How do you feel when you don't eat? When you go a long time without eating? What happens? What? You're hungry. What starts to happen? You start getting sick. Does your stomach start making noises? Yeah. How, like how? Like it rumbles, like it's roaring, basically. Can you do a good stomach rumble? I don't know what. I think you were like. Yeah. 
was good. So how would you fix it? Hold on. Would, uh, would a hammer fix that? No. Okay. How about some tape? Would some tape fix that? Oh, no. Okay, I, I got another one. How about Band-Aids? No. Band-Aids wouldn't fix that either? No. Okay, I got one last thing. I think I said that already, but glue stick. Is that true? Because I went to school, never mind. Did you eat I did not, but my brother might have. I'm kidding. Can you hold this for me? So if none of, if none of those would fix it, what about? Is that bread? I don't know. I thought it would be fun no, to uh, open it with everyone. Let me guess, it's a pillow. What about, yeah, what about bread? Would bread fix that? Bread would fix yeah. it, but not a pillow. Bread would fix that. No, I lost my notes. I found them. Here, you hold the bread. You guys can pass it that way, and then we'll pass it this way if you want. <laughs> Whew. We also, although we have a physical hunger for food, we also have a hunger for the love of God, right? And those things that I showed you, the hammer, the glue, those things won't fix our physical hunger and those things won't fix the hunger that we have for God either. Those things are nice for a while, but they don't, they don't satisfy our hunger, do they? Neither does food. And Jesus said, he is the bread of life and that only he can satisfy our hunger for him in its fullness. Now, I want to think about last Wednesday night at youth group, Aston. Do you remember that? You don't? Well, let me refresh your memory. A little blonde-haired boy came tearing through those doors right there and tearing down this way because he was really, what? Lemonade. Remember the lemonade? Okay. You're not helping me out here. Um, I think he was really thirsty, and so some of us said, did you run all the way to youth group from your house? And we joked around a little bit, but when you took a drink when you were really, really thirsty, like maybe you ran the Clomp and Classic last year, were you thirsty after that? I'm talking to you. Yeah? So when you're really thirsty, or you're really hungry, how do you drink your water, or how do you eat your food? Do you do it slowly? Do you just do it one little sip at a time, one little bite at a time? No, you, eat, I chug. you chug it, or you just stuff all the food in your mouth that you can? Right? And so I think that's what Jesus was trying to teach us in what Pastor Chris is going to talk about a little later. When he talks about he's the living water and he's the bread of life, he wants us to take him in just like we're so thirsty and we're so hungry. He wants us to take him all in, all at once, right? All right, how about we pray this morning? Thank you, God, for providing our physical hunger, for providing for our physical hunger, but for providing food for us. But we also thank you for feeding our spiritual hunger for life by sending us your son, Jesus, the bread of life. Amen. Peyton, on that chair, there's red and yellow. Can you bring that whole thing up here? And so to remind you guys that Jesus told us that he is the bread of life, you may take some of these to your seat. Um, how many? Wait, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Everybody should be able to take two if you want. Conveniently, they're red and yellow um, to celebrate that Iowa State made it further. <laughs> Never mind. I, I don't like Iowa State. I don't like Iowa State. Just kidding. Here you guys go. You may take two to remind you that Jesus is the bread of life. Um, you may take it with you until the end and then find me at the end and give it back. It is just bread. There is no peanut butter and jelly in the middle for those who might have allergies. 
you. You're welcome. Thank you. Short-term memory loss, we all struggle with it. As one legendary Liverpool manager put it, today's news is tomorrow's fish and chip paper. And it's so easy to forget what happened yesterday or to forget what others have done for us. We live in a what-have-you-done-for-me-lately kind of world. And the world of John chapter 6, the ancient world, was not much different. If you'll turn with me there to John 6 or page 1034 in those brown church Bibles. And as you're finding your spot, I want to remind us of the passage we read earlier in the service because it sets the tone, it sets the stage for this text that we're about to read together. If you remember, Jesus notices a large crowd of people following him and somehow he knows they're hungry. Maybe it's like Those times when our parents realize we're hangry and they ask us, have you eaten anything today? And he says to his disciples, where are we going to find bread for these people? And this is a rhetorical question because he's testing them. He knows exactly where their sustenance is going to come from. And you would think after all this time that they've spent with him that they would know as well. But again, that short-term memory loss sets in. And Jesus, he watches as as they sweat as they run around trying to find a human solution to this logistical nightmare. And, and then we have Andrew, who's doing the best he can, and he finds this kid with a few loaves of bread and some fish. And what does Jesus do? He rolls up his sleeves. He gives thanks to God. And then he begins to distribute more food than the whole lot of them even need. And how do they respond? In amazement. They even want to make him king. But fast forward 15 verses later, and that short-term memory loss sets in again. And so it's verse 29. And Jesus says, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. And so they asked him, well, What sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Essentially, what have you done for us lately? And this is a lot like the Hebrews who came out of Egypt back in the book of Exodus. They had never envisioned themselves being in an arid wasteland referred to as the desert of sin. And I can just see the signpost now. Welcome to the desert of sin, the never green state. And this was not the scenic route. So as resources were few and far between and as rations ran out, they did what any of us would do when their tum-tums began to grumble and when they got hangry. They began to complain, wishing they were back in Egypt. And here the God of Moses had freed them after 400 years of abuse and bondage and they wanted to go back. They wanted to go back to that way of life, which really wasn't living. You have to understand, they began to think about the bounteous cornucopia in the land of their oppressors, the jars filled with meat. They could almost taste that finger-licking good food. They wanted to be back there. And before long, as they're complaining, they, they, they forget about God, actually. And they, they begin to question his existence. Essentially, what has God done for us lately And here's what God does. He rains manna from the heavens. Manna, what is it? He rains something like bread from the heavens to to feed his his ones that are just, uh, they are famished, they are hungry. He says, come and eat. And he gives them more than they even need. But it isn't long before they forget that too. And they desire to live the kind of lives their neighbors are living. 
They begin to crave the things of this world and, and no longer keep his commands, but they find themselves in this sort of downward spiral where they're trying and trying and trying to feed this deep need in their souls, but all these things they keep trying to fill it with don't satisfy them. And so fast forward some thousands of years later, and they're still hungry. And here in John 6, Again, God says, come and eat. But this time, he offers them the true bread from heaven. And Jesus, he responds to them. He says, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the true bread of God is the bread that comes down from God and gives life to the world. Sir, always give us this bread. And then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never grow hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and you still do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up on the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. I will raise them up on the last day. At this, the Jews began to grumble about, about him because he had said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who has sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. And very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will have eternal life. And Jesus He tells them that he is the true bread from heaven. It's not manna that comes and comes today and is gone tomorrow. And it's not like any of those other fleeting things in this world that people consume. No, no, this is eternal. This is the bread of life. And this word life in the original Greek, it is zoe. Everybody say zoe with me. Zoe. I love this word. It's one of my favorites. It means more than life. It is life to the full. This is that God life that we were all made for. It's a life that's in sync with our creator, that's in step with the divine one. It is a life that's filled by Christ and overflowing with the fruit of the spirit. This is a life best lived. And that's the kind of life Jesus is offering others. A life that's so filling. But so often we find ourselves being enticed by the kind of life the world is offering us. Like Wonder Bread, it can be just so easy to consume. And I wanted to find real Wonder Bread for you, but the company actually went out of business like a decade ago. I guess people found out it wasn't that wondrous. And they, believe it or not, they called this uh, the best thing since sliced bread. But it's really nothing. And it's kind of funny that it, they went out of business. I mean, this was made during the age of preservatives when our grandparents wanted food to last a lifetime. And I guess it didn't. <laughs> and really, I mean, it's really not much of anything. I wonder if it's called Wonder Bread because people were wondering why they were calling it bread. I don't know. <laughs> but believe it or not, the government actually required them to enrich this with vitamins and minerals to to make it more like real bread, right? And this is so much like the bread of the world. And so often we try to to satisfy that deep longing in us with so many things that will always pale in comparison to the real deal, the real McCoy, the real thing. Real bread. It's robust and enriching and fulfilling and, and so much more. You take a bite and you can just chew on it. It lasts a long time. I mean, just the smell of it. And God, he wants to offer us the real deal. But so often, we settle for this. 
And people, they seek out things that always pale in comparison to the true bread of life. Like human relationships, which are important. We need human relationships to flourish, but human relationships will always pale in comparison to that divine relationship that we were all made for. And you think about power. So many people in this world, they, they crave power, but power comes and goes. Power, it's a reminder that, that every exalted throne is going to, on earth is going to be replaced by a lowered casket. And even power is a lot like Wonder Bread. I think back to that movie, one of the most uh, famous movies of all time, Citizen Kane. And Orson Welles plays Charles Kane. A person who achieved so much in his life, he gained so much, he was so successful in so many different ways, yet he was never satisfied. He kept eating the bread of the world, and at the very end, he's in this compound-like mansion called Xanadu, and he's he's on his dying bed, and he says this phrase, his last words, rosebud, and there's a a reporter named Jerry Thompson, who's desperately throughout the movie trying to find the meaning to this phrase, Rose, but at the very end, as, as uh, Cain's stuff is all being burned in a fire, there's this sled from his childhood with the imprinted words, Rose, Bud, on it. And this is a parable in and of itself. It's like that person who finds the pearl of great value but doesn't save it, doesn't sell all of his possessions for it. And you think about this idea that so many of us, we are trying to, to achieve so many different things, and we go from one success to another, but it's never enough, and we keep just trying to fill this, this vacuum in our hearts, this God-shaped hole that philosopher Blase Pascal says can only be filled by God. And that's what Jesus is offering to us here in this passage, the real thing that we're longing for for but so many of us try to to find other things to give us that that life that the world has been trying to sell us and we we find ourselves seeking out this kind of bread and as uh, playwright Heinrich Epson put it money will give you food but not appetite it'll give you medicine but not health and Solomon in Ecclesiastes 5 he says One who desires more money will never be satisfied. The person who is longing for more wealth will never be satisfied by their income. And there was a there was a philosopher, French philosopher, Simeon Well, who said, If you want to know what a person is really like, watch what they're like when they lose their money. Hmm. What do you like when you lose your money? And we've all lost a big chunk of change. And for most of us, we remember losing that big chunk of change. So many people, it's like, oh, it's like you've lost a part of yourself. Yet every single day we have the bread of life offering us that Zoe experience, offering us the real bread of life. And we often ignore this constant open invitation. And Jesus, he knows what we really need. He knows what we're really longing for. And preacher Tim Keller says, Jesus, he's not giving us the answers to the questions of life. He's saying that he is the answer. I like how Francis Chan puts it. In this passage, Jesus is very unashamedly declaring that he's the greatest. That he's greater than Moses. That his bread is greater than manna. That he is the true bread of life and the one we really need This whole passage, it's intense, it's powerful. Jesus is offering us what we've all really been longing for, but in so many ways, we end up looking for life to the full in different places, and we find ourselves never being satisfied. Everybody here wakes up every morning with an appetite for more. And so often, we turn to these user-friendly things, we turn these on and we, we satisfy our brains and we, we feed and pacify our hearts and then we wonder how we have lost true wonder, true fulfillment, true connections. And this is people of all ages. There's this anxiety people feel um, the moment they feel like they can't find their phone. If, if you want to know what, what a person's really like, 
Watch what they're like when they lose their phone, right? And there's this anxiety. And then we get it back and it's almost like, ah. It's like coming out of a pool or something. Like finally we're coming up for air again. And then we go on here and we, we, we check out all these different posts. And then we finally make our own posts or our own comments. And we somehow feel like we're back in the land of the living. Those people who forgot about us realize we're alive again. And I say that jokingly, but so many people have made this their window to life. You know what nomophobia is? It's the fear of losing our phones. And I say that because there's this thing called dopamine. It's an adrenaline that happens when people begin to turn on their devices and sort of reconnect with the other world. And the truth is, is that we find ourselves all day long reading these, these texts, getting this information and data, these images, and, and posting these memes and posting these images. And at the end of the day, we find ourselves still being hungry for more. And what Jesus is offering us here in this passage, it's actually more substantial. It is also much more intense. It might sound crazy what he says to us next. And Jesus, he says, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. Whoever eats the bread will live forever. The bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. And then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood... You have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Sounds a bit graphic, doesn't it? Just as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. And this is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. And he said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. On hearing this, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Jesus tells them that they need to eat his flesh in order to truly live, which confused his audience. I mean, they thought he was talking about cannibalism, but he wasn't. He was talking about something much more intense than that. And the, even the disciples are like, this is a hard teaching, and they're not wrong. What Jesus is offering them is hard to digest. It is hard to swallow. Because when you consume Christ, it consumes your life. And I, I love how Francis Chan puts this. He says, see, Christ doesn't want us today, 2,000 years later, to just add a little Jesus to our lives. I know. I get it. You know there's something missing in your life, and maybe you think it's religion. Maybe I should go and dab a little bit, but you can't just taste a little bit. And we often want to treat Jesus like uh, fast food or a la carte, and we can just have a little bit of him here in our life and over there in our life, and it's all good as long as it's in moderation, but there's no moderation when consuming Christ, because what Jesus is offering us is something that consumes our whole lives, that gives us that Zoe life to the full, that gives us so much more. Jesus, essentially, he is offering us a full course meal, a life that's a full course meal that begins and ends with him. And he knows that's what we need. You see, I want you to, here's a little assignment for you after you leave here today. Reread this passage and look for all the times when he says, I, me, and my And he's not just giving us a helpful hint there. He's giving us the ingredients to the real life that your soul has been searching for forever. The thing you're really longing for. And we could continue to go about eating the nothing that this world is trying to to feed us, to sell us, and feeling nothing, and becoming nothing. And there's a 
another writer, Carl Rayner, who says, in the days ahead of you, you will either be a mystic, someone who experienced God, or nothing at all. You will either be a mystic, someone who experienced God, or nothing at all. And that's what Jesus is trying to offer these people here to stop eating the nothing, the things that are here today and gone tomorrow, the things that they're just going to forget about, and start, start craving and consuming that which is eternal. Start craving the bread of life. Start consuming Christ in their life and letting him fill them to the full so that they'll never be hungry again, so that they can be in this relationship with God that truly satisfies that hole in their hearts. He says, I am the bread of life. And I don't know about you, but I'm tired of eating the nothing and feeling the nothing and being the nothing. And maybe you came here today and that's you too. And maybe, maybe you're tired of, of not living, truly living, and you want what Jesus is offering. You want that Zoe true life. If that is you, you can find me or one of the elders after the service. Please raise your hand if you're one of our elders here, one of our awesome elders. Get Marianne over there. Um, we would love, yep, we got Marlo over there. We would love to, to pray with you after the service to tell you what it's like to have Jesus in our lives, how much they've been transformed and changed, how much he's consumed us, but also filled us. And for everybody here, let's stop settling for what this world is selling us. Let's crave and desire and long for the true bread from heaven, Jesus. Let's accept his invitation to come and eat and be filled, to have that Zoe life to the full. Let's pray. As Jesus taught us to pray, let's pray our Lord gives us that daily bread, but also that bread that lasts forever. And Jesus... We know that you are the true bread from heaven. We know without you, we're not really living. We want you in our life. We know that when we consume you, you consume us. And we don't want just a little bit. We want all of you, Christ. We want to be filled. We want something that's lasting. Not just because it has a bunch of preservatives in it. We want something that's lasting because it, we know it's come from God the eternal one. Jesus, give us that life, that Zoe life. Help us to hear your invitation today to come and eat. And all of God's people say. And that's just what we're going to do. We're about to partake in the Lord's Supper. And we eat this meal knowing how sacred and special and powerful it is. And those people who we're going to come out of slavery in Egypt. They were told to have a Passover feast, to, to break of unleavened bread, and to smear the blood of the lamb over the doorpost, a reminder that that last plague of destruction would pass over their homes. This was a meal that had been a tradition for families, the families of Israel for centuries. A powerful meal, reminding that God was liberating them. And the meal that we're going to partake today, it reminds us of how that same God liberated us. As we partake in this bread, which is gluten-free, and we drink these little juice cups, we remember how Jesus liberated us on the cross, how his blood is what saved us. We remember how this is the God who says, I am the bread of life. And Jesus, at that meal with his disciples, he says, eat this bread in remembrance of me. A reminder that he's come to save us and give us life to the full. You think about the irony of that. Jesus had to give up his life in order to give us life to the full. And he did that because he loves and cares for us. That's what this meal reminds us of. That we couldn't save ourselves. We couldn't find that life on our own. We needed Jesus to make an incredible sacrifice. And so today we're going to partake in this feast. We're going to remember all that Christ has done for us. All that God is offering us. And we know that this God is present with us today. That Jesus is here. That the bread of life actually looks forward to that day in the Father's kingdom. When we'll all be at the great table feasting together again. That incredible, powerful image. And so we also think about that as we partake in this sacred meal. And my son Keen, he's got an invitation he's going to read to us. And the sacrament is going to be passed around by our elders. 
And just hold on to it, because after this song that we're about to sing, we're going to eat, eat this meal together as a family. And uh, we offer this meal to anyone who believes in Jesus and also to their children. And so as this is being passed around, I look forward to seeing how God moves in our community, how he nourishes us and reminds us of his love. And so the elements will be passed around. End of song, we'll partake in it together as one body. But, yep, Keem, please read the invitation. Come to this table, you who have much faith and you who would like to have more. Come to this table, you who would have been to the sacrament often and you who have not been for a long time. Come to this table, you who have tried to follow Jesus and you who have failed. Come, it is Christ who invites us to meet him here. Came sin, who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing. Love so.
Jesus was betrayed. He took that bread and he said, this bread is my body. Eat this in remembrance of me. In the same way. He took that cup and he said, this cup is the cup of the covenant sealed in my blood, shed for the complete forgiveness of all your sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. Please pray with me. God, it's so easy to forget how much you love us. So easy to think, what has God done for me lately? And this meal is a reminder of all you've done for us. How you gave up your life so we could have life to the full. We thank you, Jesus. Give us that true bread from heaven. Give us that Zoe life today. We celebrate you, Lord. We want you. Amen. We're going to sing this last song. This is God's invitation to us to come to the table. And it's all also our invitation to everybody here to stay and eat with us today.
come to the table to the thief and to the doubter to the hero and the coward to the prisoner and the soldier to the young and to the older all who hunger all who all the last and all the first all the paupers and the princes all who failed you've been forgiven all who dream and all who suffer all who've loved and lost another all the chained and all the free all who follow all who lead anyone who's been let down all the lost you have been labeled right or wrong to everyone who hears his song. Come to the table. Come join the sinners who have been redeemed. Take your place beside the Savior. Sit Before the blessing, a reminder that we are inviting you to join us at our table to partake and break of bread and soup and a bunch of other yummy foods as well. And if you didn't bring anything today, we have plenty of food, so please join us. And so for all gathered here, as we eat this feast, may we remember all that the Father has blessed us with, all the ways in which he has nourished us. And that he sent the bread of life, Jesus, to us. And so may we consume Christ and be consumed by Christ. And may the Spirit enable us to live that Zoe life. And all of God's people say.